well, I think we'll get get started. We're at 10 o'clock and I've got a bit of a brief intro before we hand it over to the presenters. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks, uh, yeah, thanks for taking the time. Welcome to the first session. Um, what will be a four part series hosted by Climate and Agriculture Initiative BC. Um, starting today, running till November 9th, um, on Tuesday mornings, there'll be four different sessions discussing ways climate change is impacting BC farmers and ranchers. Um, our presenters will share different approaches, tools and resources, um, and provide examples of adaptation solutions in action. These will all be recorded, uh, as this one is today, um, and made available on our website if you miss any of them. My name is Foster Richardson. I'm a regional program manager with Climate and Agriculture Initiative. Um, and I'll be hosting today's session on managing changing pest pressures. Um, uh, as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge I'm, I'm joining here from the traditional unceded territory of the Cowichan and Malahat people. And I know there's folks joining from all over the region and beyond. Um, please take a moment if you'd like to introduce yourself uh, in the chat, uh, where you're joining from, who you are, and uh, why, why you're interested, if, if you'd like to share that. Uh, make sure you select um, panelists and attendees for who you're sending that message to, or it might come just to the presenters for those who are interested as well. So we've got three presenters today. Um, we'll have about a 75 minute session in total, um, which is a little bit longer than the other one, other three sessions that will occur in the coming weeks, um, because we have, have three presenters. Um, there'll be time for Q&A, the brief sort of Q&A after each of the presenters and, and hopefully a bit of time right at the end as well. <clears throat> I'm gonna start just with a quick background on um, climate change impact we're focusing on today um, and, and very brief um, background on CAI, Climate, action, climate <laughs> Agriculture Initiative, BC. Um, um, so, Likely many of you are familiar with, with CAI, um, so we won't dwell on this, uh, but the initiative was established 13 years ago to provide proactive and pan-agricultural approach to climate change in the province of BC. Uh, our work falls primarily under two programs, the Regional Adaptation Program, which takes a, a regional approach um, to regional issues, and the Farm Adaptation Innovator Program, uh, which takes more of a farm level um, and somewhat more research-based uh, approach. The projects that, that are being presented on today fall under these two programs. And quick funding acknowledgement, projects we deliver fall within the climate change adaptation programming of the BC Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries. Funding is provided through the provincial and federal governments through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. Um, in addition to that, uh, our projects um, all have a great number of um, in-kind and other funding support through um, agricultural organizations, local governments, NGOs, and, and a large number of individuals who put a lot of work and time into that. So thankful for all of that to keep this program going. So a quick background um, on climate change uh, and pests in agriculture. <clears throat> climate change uh, has, has a number of impacts on pests. Um, broadly speaking, it, it, it can make management um, and uh, monitoring more complex for agricultural producers. Warmer temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, um, increasing variability, all uh, create added stressors for um, crops and livestock, which can make them more susceptible. Um, in addition, the same factors can contribute to um, greater winter survival for pest species, um, the potential for more reproductive cycles in a production season, um, and can enable and facilitate um, spread of pests from sort of either increasing in their um, populations within regions or even moving into new ones. <clears throat> from a management perspective, um, this can make uh, predicting and responding to the timing of pest cycles um, and when to make certain management decisions um, more complicated um, <clears throat> and 
monitoring is sort of one of the really um, effective or useful ways in, in um, ensuring that that responses are, are more effective. Um, agricultural pests does include a quite a wide range of, of things, including insects, diseases, weeds, um, invasive species. Um, today, we're focusing mainly, mainly on insects. Um, maybe you should say arthropods. Probably one of the presenters could correct me on that, but um, that's that's where this this today's session will will look a little more closely. <clears throat> uh, CAI has done work in this in this on this topic area uh, across the province. Um, we're just getting a snapshot of, of some of those projects today, but projects have been uh, initiated in the Fraser Valley, the Caribou, the Okanagan, the Peace, and Vancouver Island. Um, and these projects came from direct work with farm organizations um, and producers to identify needs and priorities. This has included documenting, oops, documenting priority pests of concern and emerging pest issues, enabling development of new decision support tools, supporting landscape level producer driven monitoring, providing accessible information about priority tests, pests, and effective management through workshops, fact sheets, field days. Um, you see a screenshot of our webpage um, on pests and, and pollinators. And uh, next week's session will be will be on pollinators. Um, <clears throat> that uh, you can organize our website around um, or there are set pages for the different uh, impact areas. You can also select regions if you're more interested in a regional focus. Okay, so moving a little more quickly into our presentations today, we have um, three different uh, projects that will be presented on. Uh, the first, <clears throat> it will be Keith Uloth, um, also with Talon Goche from the BC Peace, share their experiences establishing regional pest monitoring network um, there. And then Bonnie Zand from Bonnie's Bugs IPM from Vancouver Island, uh, presenting on a project that's building capacity for pest monitoring and integrated pest management on Vancouver Island. Uh, and finally, uh, Marjo Dessereau presenting uh, on how her and her team have developed resources uh, in collaboration with uh, small scale growers in Fraser Valley and Squamish Lillooet. We will have a session or a, a Q&A session following each presenter. Um, there's a Q&A box um, on your Zoom screen. Please use that for questions. Make sure you select the Q&A. Um, also note that there's an upvote option that you can use um, if uh, someone else asks a question that you also had or you'd like to see answered. Um, that will push that question up to the top. Um, and because we may not have time for all questions, we will we will sort of prioritize based on on those upvotes. Okay. Well, oops. I'm going to hand it over to Keith. Um, to take over, and Keith uh, is, um, yeah, the coordinator uh, or the research technique or research manager for the BCP Pest Project. Um, he's born and raised in Prince George, uh, completed a degree in biology from UNBC, and has been working with the BCP Pest Monitoring Project since 2016. Um, Keith also works um, with. Uh, the BC Peace Agro Weather Network, which is another uh, project that, that CAI has been involved in. Um, Talon Goche is, is also joining us uh, for the Q&A. Um, she's been a very key person in, in running and getting started this, this project uh, in the Peace. So I'll hand it over to Keith. So good morning, everyone. Sorry, I was trying to figure out the screen there. Um, yeah, so Talon and I uh, work together to run the BC Peace Pest Monitoring Project up in the Peace region. Uh, so yeah, just uh, a brief acknowledgement of funding partners that we've had. 
that we have currently. And then uh, we should probably mention that in the past, we've also worked with the uh, Cattlemen's Association on some projects uh, on some parts of our project as well. So I think I wasn't sure if Talon was going to talk about the history of the pest monitoring project up here in the piece, but um, we've been around since 2014. Uh, we started with some funding for uh, from A Canada uh, and the Climate Action Initiative uh, and Regional District, and then our two big associations up here in the BC piece are the BC Grain Producers and the Peace Region Forage Seed Association. So they've both uh, came on board at that time. Uh, and at that time, it was headed by the BC grain producers with the help of uh, Beaver Lodge, so the federal research farm just outside of Grand Prairie. Uh, and that that time, the um, monitoring consisted mostly of monitoring annual crops, so canola and wheat, and then a few other little cereals at, the t at that time. Uh, so in 2016, when I came on board in the fall, we got, um, <clears throat> we had just received some new funding for the project. Um, and the Forage Seed Association took over the management of it. <clears throat> uh, and it continued to monitor annual crops. So we were transitioning to uh, trying to increase the monitoring uh, slowly. Uh, when we started, it was, uh, I believe, four uh, canola fields and five, uh, four wheat, and then we've increased it slowly. We started to monitor some more forage, uh, so creeping red fescue, red clover, uh, some of those other, which have some pests that are pretty persistent. Um, and then by 2018, we had increased, you can see there, to uh, six canola, six wheat, five fescue. Um, and then uh, we were doing some disease surveys as well because that seemed to be something that we were lacking in the peace region, was just identifying which diseases are really persistent uh, as they kind of rotate through on cycles of weather and everything else. <clears throat> and then with new funding coming in 2019, um, which we received from the BC government, we didn't actually receive any of our cap funding at that time. So we had to downscale some of our monitoring, unfortunately. Um, so we scaled it back. And then in 2020, we received more funding, uh, which was secured through the Climate Action Initiative. Uh, and so we've, we've uh, grown our project in the past two years to include more crops, so more cereals uh, like barley uh, and oats, and also um, <clears throat> more annual, uh, also, sorry, field peas and uh, some other forages as well that are around that are being grown for seed. Uh, a big one for us is that we added some horticulture monitoring. So local market gardens that we've uh, we've collaborating with now uh, and also berry and apple orchards. Uh, so just to go back one step, uh, the project objectives of the of the monitoring is to monitor pest populations within field crops over a season. That slightly changed to include now some of the horticulture stuff that we're doing. Uh, obtain data for populations of insects and diseases throughout the region uh, in specific crops and provide support to researchers in conducting research of insects and diseases in the region. That's a big one for us. We like to try and uh, work collaboratively with a lot of researchers just in trying to get them to have some extension into our region. Uh, and then lastly, uh, develop baseline data for new and emerging pests in the region. So the big one, again, like I said, was uh, for horticulture. There's not a lot that's been done in the region. So we've been working with uh, Tracy and Susanna, um, the provincial entomologists, to try and establish a uh, baseline presence and absence of certain insects that we might have in the area. Um, so uh, our monitoring. Uh, is pretty similar to what you might see in some of the other uh, presentations later. Uh, we do a lot of sticky trap monitoring uh, using Delta Jackson and um, the sticky traps, uh, for a lack of a better name, they're just the yellow cards on the side uh, that we use. Uh, also, we use Vernon pitfalls for 
<clears throat> a lot of our ground insects that we have up here. And then unitraps um, are the uh, kind of round up the, the last of the, the, the traps that we're using. Uh, and then we do a lot of sweep netting, <clears throat> a lot of sweep netting. Uh, I think I told my student last season, or sorry, she was, we started in 2020, and we told her she'd be doing around about 10,000 sweeps <clears throat> uh, altogether. Uh, and that seems to be the pretty much the norm. Uh, and then we do a lot of scouting, uh, a lot of insect scouting for damage. Uh, we do a lot of scouting for diseases um, and just looking for other insects that we're not catching in sweep nets because sometimes they're, they're hiding in certain areas and we don't get to sweep the entire field. So some of the pests that we monitor, um, these are just a few. The canola is pretty much uh, all annual monitor uh, is our annual monitoring, and those are all uh, monitored through uh, pheromone baited traps. Uh, as you can see, wheat midge is another one that we do in the cereals uh, that we monitor for with pheromone baited traps. <clears throat> uh, field peas, uh, the pea leaf weevil is one that we've started in the past few years, um, kind of monitoring for. It's not found in the peace region but it is one that's encroaching on the BC piece. It has been found in the Alberta piece. And we do have some of that as well. Uh, Swede midge, I should also note, is not found in the BC piece, uh, but is, it is one that we constantly monitor for just in case we do find it. Um, and then, yeah, we another big one is across commodity pests. So grasshoppers and ligus and aphids. We do a lot of uh, sweep netting and uh, specific surveying for grasshoppers in the region, uh, just to have numbers for density purposes as they seem to fluctuate every year with the species that we have. Uh, and new to us was the horticulture. So we slowly started this one with just lots of scouting um, and looking for specific uh, signs that we had presence of insects. And then working with Tracy and Susanna, we determined that there was certain insects that we might want to monitor for more specifically, uh, which, and the big one was spotted wing drosophila. So if we had any berry growers up here, uh, that was the one that we pushed. So we've been monitoring for them for two years uh, and haven't had any signs of them, uh, fortunately. <clears throat> uh, and the other one is the uh, codling moth. Uh, so we did some scouting last year in some apple orchards that were up here. Uh, we found one or two uh, apples that had symptoms of codling moth damage. Uh, so we started monitoring with pheromone baited traps this year, uh, and we haven't had any results that were conclusive of presence this year, fortunately. So uh, the other one is forage grasses that we monitor. So that's forages that are grown for seed. Um, <clears throat> we look for a lot of case bearers in those ones uh, as they tend to uh, damage the seeds directly. Uh, and then also a big one is creeping red fescues. So the silver top, that's not a, an insect or a pest. That's a symptom <clears throat> that we continuously see. And that actually destroys the, the grass and the head uh, when, it's, when it's doing damage. And Timothy, uh, in Timothy, we do a year in pea and skipper. So that's one that's new to us as well in the past two years. Uh, and they seem to be very problematic as they spread across the prairies and actually into the interior. So the other half of the project that we do uh, is diseases. So we do a lot of site monitoring with, um, in conjunction with the sites that we monitor for pests. Uh, and we do a lot of disease survey of field crops in the region because <clears throat> we do a lot of traveling. Uh, so uh, our current surveys just in general, uh, use the World Health Organization Disease Scouting Guide, unless specified by a researcher. So ones that we commonly do right now are a club root survey, uh, which we've, we've changed. We were doing uh, plant tissue um, in 2018 and in 2020. And as of this year, working with some local agrologists uh, and researchers out of uh, Alberta, we've changed it to soil sampling. So we monitored, I think we sampled uh, 65 fields this year up in the piece, and the, and we're hoping to next year increase that to about 75, maybe to 100, and that's the hope. Uh, field piece, 
we do that one every year. <clears throat> uh, and also forages. So our forage survey covers both the BC piece and the Alberta piece uh, as the Forage Seed Association <laughs> who holds, who manages the project uh, has to manage both sides of that. So there's growers on both sides. So we, we go over into the Alberta side to do some work in there. And then cereals, uh, we tend to do, we do a, a, a survey for um, some uh, federal researcher, and we also do one for a uh, university, uh, Kucharn Brar out of the University of British Columbia. We do some serial work with him also. Uh, so yeah, so you can see that we send samples to uh, Beaver Lodge. Uh, we also send them to a provincial plant lab uh, down in Abbotsford, and then also if there are specific researchers interested, we send them up to them as well. And that's uh, usually across the um, Western provinces. So just to give an idea of how far we monitor and the range that we have um, uh, in the Peace region, it's uh, according to the Grain Industry Development Council, there's about two and a half million acres of agriculture and production. Uh, so we have quite a range to cover, uh, and that's I think that encompasses any agriculture, so cattle and and or field crops, as well. Um, and on average, we travel about during uh, a week. We average about nine hundred kilometers, uh, which is probably it might even be on the low side. There, we probably do about eleven hundred kilometers. I would say. Uh, in a week, depending on if we're doing surveys or not. So you can see where Dawson Creek is located at the bottom of the map there. I tried to fit them all in. Unfortunately, they don't seem to, it doesn't seem to be working very good. Um, and then Fort St. John, and that distance is about 100 kilometers between the two of them. And we go as far up north as to the Presbyterian area, which is about, I think, 160 kilometers further. Uh, and yeah, so our range is quite wide. Um, and quite diverse in the changing of landscape. So a big one for our project is communication. So when I started in 2016, uh, the communication to growers in the area was through an email update that was quite infrequent. We were trying to do it on a month to month basis. Uh, our growing season is only about four months, so it was only about four emails, and the list was quite small. So uh, we had a coordinator on in 2018 at the time, uh, Julie Robinson, who did some amazing work for us to help us kind of figure out how to better uh, get the message out to our growers and something that was more uh, timely for our pest issues. So we started a weekly SMS. Um, which is a text message that we would send weekly and that just kind of updates them to what we're seeing out in the field. Uh, and we also created a Facebook page um, to also put our updates on there and to try and get some interest and generate some, uh, some feedback from growers and let them know what else we were seeing through that with images and stuff like that. Uh, and then we also started a bi-weekly uh, article uh, the pest of the week in a local newspaper uh, in hopes of trying to to get uh, the word out there for pest issues that people might be seeing during the growing season. Uh, and we also promote other aspects of uh, IPM. So there's the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network, uh, which is a federal based program that kind of uh, helps to uh, increase knowledge for farmers and uh, gives them lots of tools. Uh, and then in 2019, with the cutbacks that we had, we kind of went down to the, um, we just kind of, we had to scale back our thing. So our Facebook page kind of went, took a hit. We were continued to do the SMS updates. Um, and then we, uh, to kind of offset not having the Facebook page because we didn't have a student to do it, um, we started uh, working with the BC ministry. Uh, to send out through their uh, weekly email updates, which they send out to um, local associations, and then it gets chained on to other growers in the area. Uh, and then uh, in 2020, when we got uh, funding for a student to come back, <laughs> we continued to use the SMO updates 
the ministry update continued and then we continued with our Facebook page as well to try and increase the, um, <clears throat> the variety of people that we can reach within our region. So our SMS update, which we've had a lot of positive feedback on, uh, lots of people seem to really like it. Um, we, this is kind of how we've, we have scaled it or I guess put it together. Uh, so we have the time period through which we, um, which we are reporting on. Uh, and then we highlight what from the week, what we've seen. Um, so on this week, we, we had a Ligus bug warning from the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network. We were out in the field and we were seeing very similar uh, things. So we just kind of generalized it in a sense that uh, to let our growers in the area know that they should be out scouting. Um, and then we kind of let them know that the threshold levels that they should be looking for. Um, and then the other part of that is that we do grow staging. So for the three major crops that are kind of grown in the area, canola, wheat, and peas, we do use a BBCH scale, uh, which some people don't necessarily use, but we have to try and keep it as general as possible. Uh, we also let them know growing degree days for certain areas and that they can access it through our local BCP agri weather network. Um, and then with the email chain that gets sent out, we list, we put a little link to local to websites or useful tools for IPM um, and to uh, and stuff like that. So podcasts or um, local scouting charts or thresholds and stuff like that, that people might find necessarily might find useful. So um, research connections, this is just kind of like tying all together what our project does, because a big one for us is with all the data that we do collect, um, we want to try and uh, get it out there to as many people as possible to use. So the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network is a big one for us. Uh, all our annual monitoring, uh, our collections go through, go to them. Uh, and so that's sent to Beaver Lodge and then it's sent on to Saskatoon. Um, and the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network encompasses uh, Manitoba West. So it's quite a big range um, and they use a lot of their, that data for forecasting and modeling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, we've started to work, uh, we've been working for the past few years, sorry, um, on a, a La Terra Day a survey so that's click beetles up here in the Peace region uh, with Wim Van Herc, who've been trying to establish what species we have uh, and what species are not here currently. Um, and then, uh, yeah, on top of that, the silver top, which I've already previously mentioned, that's a big one that we've worked on. Um, fescue is a, is a big field crop that's grown up here. Uh, and silver top is, um, is quite damaging. Uh, we saw uh, quite a bit of it last year with the heat wave uh, that we we all incurred in the province. Um, so it was one that we've been looking at. Uh, Disease-wise, stem eye spot is another one. We work with a researcher out of Beaver Lodge um, to try and uh, he's looking into uh, how stem eye spot is transferred from plant to plant. So he comes over onto into the BC piece and we help him do some research in that. Um, I've already mentioned the club root survey that we do in, within the province. Um, and then stripe rust is another one with that we work a lot with with researchers uh, in the province. That's a big one uh, through the rest of the prairies. Uh, and then the establishment of horticultural pests. That's one that we're working with the Northern Core Hope. Uh, and uh, C CAI has provided us some funding to do that as well. And that's just trying to determine what species, uh, what insects that we have up here uh, that affect horticultural crops, that affect market gardens and what is specifically grown in those. Um, and then, yeah, and then we also do a cereal and forage disease survey with um, conjunction with the UBC researcher. So um, some of the challenges of our project continue to be, uh, one is fun. Can wrap up uh, quick, we're, we're getting tight on time. Okay, sorry. Thanks so much. <laughs> uh, so one of the big ones is funding. 
as you can see, we can only usually uh, get two to three years of funding, and this is something that needs to be uh, a long term, and and that seems to be the hardest thing to do is get long term funding. Uh, and then the other one for us is covering the entire region. Uh, the the BC piece is quite a big uh, region, and so it's always hard to get sites um, and wor work around that because travel is a huge cost to us uh, with travel. Um, so it, finding sites and getting the funding in the, and always the changing of demand uh, and then knowledge transfer, just trying to get that information out there is always hard for us because uh, every grower is different. And with the wide range of age, it's hard to reach certain growers uh, with respect to their knowledge of, say, the internet or uh, technology, and then seasonal change, uh, seasonal challenges as well. So weather, pest pressures, and disease pressures—they always change, which is always hard for us to try and sometimes navigate through. So, I guess that's where I'll end it. So, questions? Thank you so much, Keith. <laughs> It highlights just how much how much you've got going on up there. It's really great to see. Um, but we don't have any questions in the Q and A. There is one question um, in the discussion that that is a fairly technical one focused on coddling moth. Um, given that we're a little tight for time, I'm I might sort of placehold that question for the end of the session because I know. Um, Bonnie will be talking about probably coddling moth and there might be that might be a great question for for everyone to to weigh in on it it's about trapping um methods for coddling moth so I think I'll I'll pop that down to the <clears throat> bottom and with no oh there is there is one question that I'll that I'll ask uh and then we'll move over to Bonnie so Keith is there a specific app or program you're using for the SMS update to growers uh yes it's called mighty text um, and we've had a decent amount of success. There are limitations to it. Um, like most apps, you can upgrade to, uh, to have the pro version of it. Um, and the one that we have is the lesser just with the cost alone. So we use the lesser one and, um, it just limits the amount of characters that you can use and a few things like that, but it's, uh, it's been pretty good. Uh, mighty text. I would check it out. Thanks, Keith. Okay, so again, hopefully we'll have an even bit more time for discussion questions at the very end, but in order to keep moving along our timeline, I'm going to pass it now over to Bonnie Zand. So Bonnie Zand um, is the owner operator of Bonnie's Bugs IPM, Vancouver Island-based consulting company that assists growers with managing insect pests. Take it away, Bonnie. All right, uh, there we go. Can you see my screen? I'm good, all right. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Bonnie Zand and I'm running the Vancouver Island Pest Pollinators and Beneficials Project or VIPPB. Uh, we're based on Vancouver Island and this is a new project for 2021 uh, put on by Climate and Agriculture Initiative and we have the goal of increasing pest monitoring and IPM practices on Vancouver Island. Uh, so to start with, I wanted to give you a bit of Vancouver Island context. Uh, so Vancouver Island, as I'm sure you know, is located at the southwest corner of British Columbia. Agriculture on Vancouver Island uh, tends to be focused kind of along the strip of the East Coast. We've got Campbell River uh, here kind of at the, the northern mostly reach of our agricultural area. Uh, and then as we move south down the coast, we've got the, the Comox Valley, uh, which is where we had some of our monitoring sites. And as we move down, we've got uh, Nanaimo, Cowichan Valley, uh, which is where we had another of our monitoring sites. And then down here in the, the southern uh, corner of Vancouver Island uh, is another area that has quite a bit of our agriculture on the Saanich Peninsula and the, the Capital Regional District. There is also some agriculture in the center of Vancouver Island uh, here near Port Alberni. Uh, we weren't able to have any monitoring sites there this year, but there's always room for expansion next year. Agriculture on Vancouver Island uh, tends to be made up of a lot of small, highly diversified farms. 
And most of those farms are marketing directly to their consumers, either through agritourism, community supported agriculture, or selling at farmers markets. Um, because of these methods of marketing and the small size of these farms, there's often a lack of connection with some of the larger commodity groups, like for example, the BC Blueberry Council. And that lack of connection then also translates into a lack of connection to a lot of IPM resources. So for example, the BC Blueberry Council puts out a blueberry IPM newsletter uh, for all of their growers every week during the growing season. And a lot of the Vancouver Island growers aren't connected to that or to other sources of IPM information. There's also on Vancouver Island, a lack of any large IPM consulting companies. So we have nothing that remotely resembles uh, ES Crop Consult over in the Fraser Valley. There are a few uh, local IPM consultants. I'm such a consultant, uh, but much more limited scope. And thus far, there's been no coordinated Vancouver Island wide monitoring. And so that is one of the things that this project aimed to kind of put into place. There's also a lack of Vancouver Island specific resources. Uh, most of our information comes from the Fraser Valley, but we have very little information about what specific pests are issues on Vancouver Island and Vancouver Island specific pest timings. There's also just in general, a lack of small farm specific resources. A lot of resources are based either towards home gardeners or larger scale farms, which don't, neither, neither of those really meet the needs of these small diversified farms. And so we, Vancouver IPPB comes into this context and we're trying to address uh, some of these lacks of connection and, and gaps. Uh, so one of our focuses was on increasing pest monitoring. And so we had 12 farms over two regions, the Comox Valley in the north and the Cowichan Valley in the south. And each of these farms was monitored every other week. During our monitoring, we were collecting baseline data on what pests were present, what uh, pest stages and its population timings. And then we could take that information on our monitoring and use it to support and educate growers on what the current pests that they should be concerned about were. This monitoring was also designed to provide detection and early warnings of any new pests arriving or any changes in pest timings, perhaps due to climate change. Uh, during our monitoring, we also collaborated with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries. So we had a uh, regional agrologist, Emily Carmichael, who was located in the South Island, and she was uh, very helpful with collecting some data on spotted rain drosophila uh, down in the Saanich Peninsula region as well as helping us connect uh, with other growers. And we were also assisted by Angela Voss in the North Island. Other crops we looked at uh, for tree fruit, we looked at apple and pear. We looked at raspberries, blueberries, and strawberries. And for vegetables, we looked at carrots and brassicas. We used a variety of techniques for our monitoring. So we had these yellow sticky traps, which we used for monitoring carrot rust fly. We also had pheromone traps for monitoring codling moth. We used red sticky spears for monitoring for apple maggot, as well as vinegar traps for monitoring spotted wing drosophila. And then as well as these trap-based techniques, we also did field walks, which just involved moving through the fields in a standardized manner, looking at leaves, flowers, fruits, and we're looking for pests like aphids, spider mites, caterpillars, and then just anything else that might show up of interest. We were also interested in increasing beneficial insect monitoring in our region. And we actually took a very different tactic uh, for the beneficial insects. And so we actually started a citizen science project using the platform iNaturalist. And I'm gonna be talking about this in the webinar next week. But if you are interested, you please attend the webinar, or you can also check out our iNaturalist project, uh, and I have the link here. That's all I'll say about that one. We also wanted to empower growers to do their own IPM and their own monitoring. And so to further this, we did a number of on-farm workshops during the growing season. We did a workshop in Victoria, one in the Cowichan Valley, and one in the Comox Valley. Uh, so at these workshops, we taught some IPM basics, and then went into the fields and did some hands-on pest monitoring and teaching insect identification. 
Uh, these workshops were also opportunities to connect growers with IPM resources. Uh, so for example, we use the CAI Small Farm IPM Guides, which I think Marjo is going to talk more about uh, in the next presentation. Uh, those were an excellent resource for us to provide to these growers and they really laid out how to put up together an IPM program. We also use these as a way to link growers with the regional agrologists. So Emily Carmichael was able to attend one of our workshops and at the other workshops where an agrologist was not able to attend, we were still able to let the growers know that that was a resource that they could uh, get in touch with. We also introduced them to resources like the BC Plant Health Lab, uh, the BC Production Guide and other books. Uh, we also provided access at the workshops to monitoring supplies. So we provided at cost things like yellow sticky cards and pheromone traps, just trying to really reduce any kind of barriers to starting a monitoring program for these growers. We were encouraging growers to go back to their own farms and do their own monitoring. And then we also asked them to contribute that monitoring back to our project so that we could increase our regional scale. And also as an opportunity to continue to support growers, they were able to send us photos of what they were seeing which we could then confirm that their identifications were correct, giving them kind of the confidence to, to use that information. So a, a big theme throughout our project was connecting growers to resources. Uh, and so we wanted to give them information on beneficial insects, so identification, what's the point of a beneficial insect anyways, how do you attract them? And then the same thing with our pest insects, how do you identify them? What are some management strategies? What are some more resources for growers to, to learn more about those pests? Uh, we also wanted to connect growers to the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries updates. Uh, and so we had updates on the forage monitoring project put on by um, AFF and also any pest alerts. Uh, again, the small farm IPM guides were a resource that we, we were really trying to push for the growers. And then just ministry fact sheets, BC production guides, any other resources we could find. And so we made those connections both through our workshops, uh, but also through our Facebook page. And so here's a, an example of one of our Facebook posts. Uh, so just providing growers with a link to some more information on how to test their fruit for spotted winged Drosophila. So we would put things like that up there on the Facebook page. And then a big piece of connecting with growers was through our newsletter. And so our newsletter went out every other week over the growing season. We had nine editions in 2021. So this was where we posted our monitoring information. This is also where we would often have a beneficial insect focus or an update on our iNaturalist project. We put in a pest focus, taking a, a pest that was currently showing up in fields and just providing a little bit more information, uh, again, about that identification, that management and links to more resources. The newsletter was also a place to put info about any workshops we were putting out and again, to provide those ministry updates and get those to growers. The newsletter was distributed through our Vancouver Island Farmers Institutes who then passed it on to their members. We also sent it out by email to anyone who wanted to subscribe to the project. Uh, and then also again, put up on our Facebook page and also on Twitter. Uh, so I hope that you would like to learn more about our project. We are hoping to carry on next year in 2022. Uh, so the easiest way to get connected with our project and see what we've been up to, uh, this QR code will take you to our Facebook page, uh, or you can follow the link there. Uh, once you're on our Facebook page, I've actually pinned the top post on the Facebook page, has a link to this folder that contains all of our newsletters. For the past year. So you can have a look back and see what we were doing, what information we were providing, and also see what tests we found. Um, that same pinned post at the top of the Facebook page also has a link to subscribe to our newsletter so that you'll be able to get it directly to your email inbox next year if you so choose. Uh, as well, you can follow us on Twitter. And again, here is our iNaturalist link if you want to check out that part of the project. And if you have any questions about our project, uh, you can also send me an email here, bonnie at vifarmmonitoring.com. Uh, so I want to say a big thank you to all of the collaborating growers for our project. We obviously could not have done this without farmers letting us in their fields. And also a uh, thank you to my team. Uh, Kira Jax was our newsletter editor and Natasha Timo was our field scout.
kind of think about it. Great, thank you so much, Bonnie. That was a really great, great recap. Um, we've we've just got one one question in the Q and A um, that I'll I'll turn to you as I think as well over to um, Keith and and to Flag for Marjo maybe to answer when you're on your presentation. But um, the the question is about presentation results or result presentation of the results and whether the results from the monitoring will be included in these presentations. Um, should add that wasn't sort of what we flagged for this this day. This is more recapping how these projects have unfolded. Um, but I think it's really, really important maybe to speak to how each of these projects um, does communicate and share results. And, and um, I do wonder if this is maybe asking a bit more about the sort of some of the um, pest specific or, or more technical side of the results. So maybe Bonnie, you can start and then Keith can, can answer that as well. Yeah. So. I'm not going to tell you everything that we found um, because we looked at a lot of different pests on a lot of different crops. Um, we just have a little bit of time here, as, as Foster said, just to talk about what the project itself was. Um, again, you can look back at all of our past newsletters at that link if you want to you know, look at those. And then there will also be a report written this winter, which will kind of summarize what we found uh, in terms of the different pests, and, and how their populations changed. And of course, the, the really interesting thing is always going to be as we get uh, multi-year information to see how pests are changing. Um, that's what I'm, I'm really excited about. And I think it's, it's so great that Keith has multiple years of data um, that they can look at. Um, I will say that we didn't find anything particularly surprising because our project was based on looking at pests that we already knew uh, that they were pests. We already knew that growers were having issues with them. And we were just trying to support growers in using IPM to manage them. Uh, and so we don't have any amazing, exciting things about some new pests that showed up, um, which is, is good. I'm glad we didn't find anything um, particularly special. Uh, but yeah, nothing, nothing groundbreaking in terms of what we found, just more information that is supporting growers being able to know what to look for in their fields uh, and know how to manage it. Uh, yeah, so um, from the Peace region, like from our monitoring perspective, a lot of our data gets filtered into uh, the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network. Uh, so the federal government takes a lot of our annual monitoring stuff uh, and their data and puts it into their data that kind of correlates across the entire prairies. <clears throat> uh, and we also do um, a weekly, uh, with our SMS, we were doing the, with our text message updates, we were doing a, um, including not numbers essentially, but we were letting people know if we were finding things near threshold or if they should be out scouting, those kinds of things. And then like Bonnie said, we were doing, we also do a uh, summary of what our findings were uh, in the, over in the winter. Uh, and we send that out to uh, our producers or our growers in the area if they want it uh, and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, Bonnie kind of answered most of what we do up here as well. Great, thanks Bonnie Keith and, and Marjo, hopefully you can, you can touch on that uh, during your presentation. So um, we will turn over to Marjo. Desiro, who is an integrated pest management specialist and research director with ES Crop Consult, um, it's located in Pemberton, uh, which provides IPM services to local farmers. Thanks so much, Margo. Yes, thank you. Can you see my screen all right? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Keith and Bonnie, uh, for presenting your projects. It was uh, super great to see other projects in other areas. Um, let's see if that's going to switch or not. Hmm. There's some. So, do you see my slides change? Some for some reason they're in. Oh, okay. Maybe there's a bit of a delay. Um, so yeah, so we have uh, developed 12 uh, small scale farmers 
IPM guides, and we these were released in the spring of 2021. So today I'll focus on uh, the process or the, the unique approach that we took in creating these guides. So I'm going to focus on how we created the, created these guides, and of course to promote the guides promote workshops that we're going to be hosting this winter. So first, before we start, I want to zoom out a little bit and explain why it was important for us to focus on small scale farms. So we see, and Bonnie touched on that, but we see that um, medium to large scale farms are often well connected. They have a support system in place uh, to deal with, with their pest issues. Um, you know, whether they're connected with private consultants or maybe they're connected with chemical representative or maybe they're uh, often part of growers association. So small scale farms are don't always have that support system in place to deal with their pest issues. So therefore, there's uh, a gap in pest management activities on small scale farms. And it's mostly around a uh, lack of monitoring, uh, of um, knowledge of available tools, uh, and maybe available resources out there that are specifically made for small scale farms. So um, we the the approach that we took was unique because we collaborated directly with small scale farmers. Um, and this was done via a two year pilot project that involved farm visits and uh, that was in Pemberton and the Fraser Valley. And so we, um, via those farm visits, we offered our time, our expertise, our knowledge to the growers and really in turn, they were, um, they felt connected with the project and offered their time, expertise and knowledge to us. Uh, in making these guides. And so that that hopefully made um, guides that are really relatable to small scale farms and are gonna be really use, useful. So here's the timeline of our project. So this was, a, it's a three year project. Uh, we're in a third year and um, 2019 was the first year where we, um, created draft manuals and, uh, the second year, then we had a test run of those manuals. And so the first two years included uh, farm visits and collaboration with growers. So for some of you that want to know exactly, this is just one slide uh, telling you maybe the numbers a little bit more. So we worked on the first year, we worked with uh, seven farms and uh, we did three farm visits uh, per farm. And the first year, the, the objectives were to create a short list, so which best we were going to be working on. Um, and this was done via interviews with the producers, but also via observations in the field of things that came up as best issues. Um, so in doing these visits, we also introduced some integrated pest management practices. Um, and that was maybe setting up the grower or their staff into monitoring key pests. And, and then um, from that, we could observe the feasibility of these monitoring on small scale farms and also management techniques. Uh, so then in year two, we had draft manuals and we then gave them to the growers, to their staff and set them up to try them out and give us feedback. And that was done via conversation uh, with growers, but also uh, via a guided questionnaire at the end. So uh, what were the criteria for our pest selection? So of course, the growers, our observations, we consulted uh, industry specialists, and we really wanted to focus on uh, pests that um, if you monitor for, you're going to improve your management. So that was sort of the bigger criteria for us. Um, and uh, so we, as pest consultants, we had a list in mind of things we might be wanting to work on, but we had some surprises. Um, and two-spotted spider mites was one of these surprises uh, on cucumbers. And it's not because we don't know that they're around. It's just that we realized that, well, first of all, small scale farms that grow vegetables often have a cucumber component. Uh, that they grow in greenhouse in their production. So, um, and it was, you know, 2019 was a 
bad year for sp uh, for spider mites. And uh, so most growers quite a sort of didn't know what it was and that was taking down their cucumbers and um, didn't know how to identify spider mites, how to treat for them. And spider mites are going to become more and more of an issue as the climate change. So we uh, implemented some release of predators that year. And in Pemberton now, uh, really most of the growers release predator mites as a preventative method uh, following up this project. So um, here is the pest list. So the 12 guides. So we have uh, caterpillars in brassicas and caterpillars in berries. Um, we have two spotted spider mites on greenhouse cucumbers and berries. Um, and then we have more specific one like carrot rust fly. We have a tuber flea beetle in potatoes, a downy mildew on onions, which is linked to thrips, uh, powder mildew on cucurbits. And then we had uh, aphid and scorch virus and uh, on blueberries. And that's a hot topic these days. So um, we're glad that we did this one. And then a mommy berry uh, guide, a yellow rust guide, and a powdery mildew on strawberries. So here are the so those are the guides. Um, they're on the CAI website. So uh, this is where you can find the results from our <laughs> from our project. But um, so what's in the guides anyway? Uh, so I will go through some of the uh, sections of the guides, um, and I'm not going to show you all of the sections, but I more specifically want to focus on the test run takeaways for, for this. So what came out of the field visits and the, this collaboration with growers. So first of all was uh, great pictures. I mean, pictures are good, but actual size of insect is important because while it's nice to have really clear picture with maybe a 10X or a 50X lens, growers, it's not what they see in the field. So uh, we included a lot of, uh, as much as we can, pictures of how they actually look like uh, and also their size once you print the, the guides. Um, so we've included that. Another test run takeaway was that damage is very important. So again, it comes back to growers are busy and often, unfortunately, they'll find the damage before they find the actual pest. Um, so uh, having pictures of how does it look like earlier on so that it can detect it early. And then also the progression of damage, like where am I at? Like, am I in the worst, worst care scenario right now or am I early detection? So those are the things that we included. And uh, Another test run takeaway was that specificity is very important. So on our um, how to monitor section in these guides really focus on small scale farms because that's where we think the resources are lacking out there. Um, so and sometimes a picture is worth a thousand word where you have like a picture showing how to peel onion leaves to see for, th for look to look for thrips. Um, so that was helpful, but also having a section where we have a quick method of monitoring so that they can do the full on monitoring protocol, but they can also use a quick method while they're doing other farm activities. So we included that as much as possible. And then uh, risk assessment and risk factors were really important for growers. Uh, so they have a thousand things they could be focusing on that day. And they wanna know, where do I stand? Like, is this a pest that I need to look at today? Like, am I like in the high risk for this pest? So we tried to include as much as possible those risk factors. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, we had specific thresholds when it was available, but a threshold is also need, needs context sometimes uh, into what's the crop stage and what, you know, uh, yeah, so what are the factors that uh, makes it really a, a hot topic today. <laughs> um, so, and then, so the last one that I'm going to present today in terms of test run takeaway would be the problem solving and management decision making process. So, Growers really, um, some, quite a bit of them came back to us and said, you know, like just having you on the farm, you guys on the farm and uh, going through the problem solving process 
uh, maybe they had like a lettuce issue and then you're like, you, you don't know what it is, but let me bring you through my thought process of what this could be, what this could not be looking at how it show, uh, how it's showing up. So, um, and this is something then that because the guides are really focused on pest specific. Um, so this is something then that we want to bring to our workshops. So focusing on the process of problem solving and decision management making is what we're going to focus on. Um, so we will be hosting workshops uh, this winter and um, uh, it's going to be mostly in February, early March. Um, so if you think that uh, these workshops would be of interest to your network or your uh, clients, uh, yeah, just email me. My email uh, is here at the bottom and I'll send you the promo then when it's uh, ready. Um, so yeah, get, get excited for those. So yeah, in summary, direct consultation was very invaluable for this process. Um, share the field guides there on the CAI website and get excited about the workshop. So I also wanted to uh, acknowledge my co-lead on this project, which is Drew Yates, uh, and also other ES folks that worked with me on that, especially Allison uh, Middlestat. Um, so also thanks to my grower collaborator and to the funders. And yeah, I'm happy to take questions if you have any questions. Great, thank you so much, Marjo. Um, and we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. The first one, um, how do you think technology can help farmers fighting and monitoring pests and diseases? Interesting question. This could be a to the whole group question as well, or to Bonnie and, and Keith as well. Um, so for us, you know, if I bring it back, because we're crop consultant, we're monitoring, we're, you know, we're helping the farmers, like technology can help, uh, you know, I know that, you know, drones and things like that, like for a lack of better of time, you know, to be able to, you know, as a grower, walk your fields, uh, a drone can be helpful, like, you know, so there's definitely some technologies out there that can be useful to both growers and ourselves consultants. So, um, yeah, uh, I think technology is also helpful um, if there's any app that could be created to gather your pest information because um, keeping track of your pests from year to year is really important. And this is something that we really try to encourage uh, in the guides that we've created. We have a data sheet there, but I mean, this is still paper and a lot of the growers are still like paper uh, focused, but like as we go, having all of this on the computer, being able to compare year to year, the timing. So over years, you can track timing of best and then be better prepared for the following year and say like, yeah, this show up in June or, you know, so that can help. I don't know if that answers the question is the question. Oh, I didn't see the lower. Yeah, we offer a pest and disease monitoring system. Yeah, so autom automated traps. Um, we at ES, we have a project in the lower mainland uh, with uh, traps for late blight. So again, the the traps, you know, are um, helpful in a way where they it's an added piece of information. So we're trapping for the spores of late blight. And then you take into account what you're finding in those traps. You take into account what you're finding uh, in terms of weather, you know, what's the weather like, what are you finding in the field? So, yeah. Any other question? I'm wondering if Bonnie or, or Keith want to add anything on the technology piece. I would say that smartphones are amazing. Um, the ability to, to go into a field and see something and take a picture of it and, and like a decent quality picture, I, that, was, that was one thing that I think is a great use of technology. And that, you know, even with the, the growers, we were encouraging them to, to send us photos. 
you know, for them to be able to do that. I don't know how many conversations I've had with someone where they're trying to describe to me what, what they're seeing. Um, and I'm trying to understand it. And then you, you pull out a photo. You're like, oh, that. Um, so just the ability to, to, for everyone to be walking around with a piece of technology in their pocket, I think is, is really great. Uh, and then our, our iNaturalist project that I'll talk about next week is all photo based. Uh, and so again, being able to document things uh, using photos and being able to be connected to resources. There are so many resources available on the internet. Uh, and so that was you know, another big part of our project. It wasn't any kind of fancy technology. It was just saying, hey, here's a spot you can go to look at these things. You, you can have those small farm guides on your phone. So it's not like you're walking around with a bunch of pieces of paper in your pocket uh, and then just pull those out when you need them. Uh, so those are kind of the, the technologies that I think are, are important for the future is just increasing those abilities to observe and to share what you're seeing. Yeah, I, I agree with Bonnie. Uh, the biggest ones that I've seen are the is having a smartphone uh, and being able to be in field in real time, take a picture and essentially like iNaturalist or even having a guide at your fingertips in the field and looking and being able to read that stuff and see that information that you necessarily will need in the field rather than having a book. Uh, and I mean, up in the prairies, it's, it's windy. So having a book, your pages can fly away <laughs> and you won't be able to see it. But if you have it on your phone, you can take a look you can see. And then, yeah, with um, what Marjolene said about drones and stuff. Um, I know there's lots of producers up here that are starting to use drones to for field scouting because they have entire sections, like thousands and thousands of acres of land. And to scout it in a day is, would take them a long time so they can fly it with a drone and necessarily see where there's patches of field that are, are growing. So, yeah. There's, there's definitely room for advance in technology and, and, uh, and pest management. There was a, a question specific to Vancouver Island that, that Bonnie answered um, by uh, typing um, about the use of weather stations. Um, and, and Bonnie said how that wasn't a part of the project on Vancouver Island. Um, but Keith, I'm wondering if, if you can speak to, and this sort of ties in technology, the, um, the relationship between the, the weather network up in the BC piece and the pest monitoring and, and what that sort of means and what the potential of that is. Uh, yeah, so the BC piece agri weather network, um, we've kind of partnered them together in a sense because weather is connected so strongly to pest and disease presence. Um, and I mean, a lot of our insects are blown in, they're migratory. So they come in from the south up here. So we do have um, local weather stations that are um, that give growers in our area uh, a little more localized weather, but we also do provide tools on there. So um, some of them, one of the ones we have is for wheat midge. Uh, and what a grower can do is they go in they will input their seeding date, um, their seeding date, and I, I don't even think they have to put the type of cross, um, variety of wheat that they have, but they put the seeding date in and then they hit uh, calculate and it will develop a little uh, a pie chart that tells them if they're at risk for wheat midge or if there's low risk. And it's all based on um, what the, the precipitation and everything in that area has been accumulating. So it's very easy for a grower to go on there and say, oh, should I be scouting for wheat midge now? Or is the risk low? And they just type in their seeding date and it spits out a bit of an idea for them. So at least they're aware if they need to be out there or not. And I think we have a fusarium uh, tool as well up on, on that website for people to use. Thanks, Keith. Um, another question here. Um, see great work being done on pest identification, monitoring, and working with growers. Out of curiosity, does IPM also include sharing knowledge on combating pests through chemical biological control? Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on that and and ask um, sort of if if um, maybe each of you can speak to how how the projects um, 
have what the sort of on the ground impact and how producers have used that in their own management and what that what that looks like. Keith, do you want to start? <laughs> uh, sure. So, um, yeah. So for for us up here, knowledge transfer is a big one. Um, on come padding fest. Um, there's been a shift, I mean, for large scale agriculture uh, up in the piece. Um, there's been a slight shift of trying to promote people getting away from chemical spraying. Uh, I mean, there is a necessity for it at times, but we've seen in the prairies, that, uh, at least uh, I have, that there's a, a shift, at least for promoting beneficial insects. So, um, Ag Canada has a beautiful uh, program that they have out now called the Pest and Predator Project. Uh, and so they basically will, um, they have guides out and stuff like that. So if you're seeing diamondback moths in your field, you can look and you can say, okay, well, there's, um, you know, tachnid flies or something else that's out there that is attacking them. And so that uh, a producer can be out there and say, well, I'm seeing this pest, but I'm also seeing this, benef this beneficial insect so um, essentially you might be, you might not have to use a chemical spray, the biological route might be even better. So there is promotion of it. Uh, and that's something that I've seen since I've started in 2016 working, there's been a shift to try and promote that. But there still is a, a, a necessity of having chemical spraying around if needed. Um, so yes, for, for our project, we, uh, I didn't show it um, on, my, on my presentation, but we, had a, we have a section on how to manage and it includes uh, predator uh, consideration. So biocontrol, chemical control, physical control. So, it, you know, IPM does include all of the different controls. So the goal is to use different tactics. So, um, so yes, yeah, so this is a section on our guides. Yeah, I mean, similar with our project, uh, as Margaret said, IPM involves many different sorts of controls and, and choosing the right one for each specific situation. And so our, our project was focused on doing the monitoring and therefore providing information to the growers so that they could then use that both to know what to look for in their fields, but also to, to know what sort of controls would be appropriate. Uh, and so I mean, in our workshops, it was really great to be able to take growers out into the fields and to show them things like mummified aphids uh, that have been parasitized by wasps and say, you know, this is what this looks like. So if you're seeing this, you're seeing a beneficial biological control. And so that impacts how you make a decision about whether or not you're going to put in a chemical control. Uh, and we definitely just found that, yeah, de decision making was really impacted by our project. So one example of a way that our project um, kind of helps growers is uh, we did the rust fly monitoring for carrot rust fly. Uh, and so some of our growers were managing carrot rust fly through covering with row cover, uh, which is a non-chemical control, but which can be a bit of a pain because you've got this row cover that blows off or deer walk on it and then you have to manage it. And we had other growers that were managing rust fly uh, through chemical sprays. And by being able to help those growers know whether or not they actually had rust fly, they were able to change their decisions about whether or not they felt secure in removing their row cover and not having to worry about that for a while in the summer, uh, or whether they felt okay with not doing their sprays. So we had some carrot fields um, that were never covered and were never sprayed and were still fine. And the growers were able to feel confident in making those decisions not to cover and not to spray at all for that, that carrot fields growing season because of the monitoring data. Uh, and so that's kind of where the, this project is hopefully going, is helping growers to be able to make those decisions about whether they want to apply sprays or don't apply sprays to conserve their biological control or grow cover or any of those other things. Just providing information so growers can make good decisions. Great, thanks, Bonnie, Marjo, Keith, and we're at um, eleven fifteen on the dot. So we will wrap up now. Thank you, everyone who attended. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Marjo, Bonnie, Keith, and and Talon is here as well. Um, really appreciate 
everyone taking the time. Um, so to keep in the loop on project results, you can keep an eye on our website. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter, climateagriculturebc.ca slash subscribe. Um, these recordings will all be available, the recording from today, as well as the subsequent three sessions will be available. Um, and just a flag, so next week it's monitoring and supporting pollinator populations in a changing climate. The following is investigating crop suitability for changing climate conditions. And the final session on November 9th is agricultural water management in a changing climate. Okay, thank you everyone and have a great day and hope to see you at some further sessions. <laughs>